Welcome again to everyone who is joining our broadcast today. My name is Kim Brown, and I'm with the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities Transition and Employment Projects. I will be one of your two moderators today. Teresa Baldry will be the other. We do have CART or live captioning available for today's session. And in order to access the captions, please open the captioning link that I've posted into our chat box or that you see on the screen in front of you. If you open that in a new browser window, that will give you the caption box. And then you can adjust the background color, text color, and font using the drop down menus at the top of that captioning box. You can click back to our webinar browser and you can position the captioning window wherever you would like that to be. Because the captions scroll up from the bottom, you may want to minimize the caption box and put it at the bottom of your webinar screen. And you'll notice if you are using the captions that the caption box has an option to show or hide the caption header and chat boxes just to make for a cleaner screen if that's what you prefer. If you have any difficulties with the captions, type in a question and we will try and help you through that. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Montana Deaf Blind Project and is funded in whole or in part by the US Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. Support for the webinar is also provided through a contract with Children's Special Health Services at the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The statements shared in the presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the sponsoring departments. Please note that all of our audience members are muted. This cuts down on the background noise and allows everyone to hear our presenter. If you want to ask the presenter a question or make a comment, please type your question or comment into the chat or question box. And please note that only you, the moderators, and the presenter will be able to see what you've typed into that question or chat box. If you're not seeing that box on your screen right now, look to the upper right hand part of your screen. There should be an orange box with a white arrow in it. Click on that and it will open the dashboard and that will allow you to access the chat or the question box. For those of you who requested Montana Office of Public Instruction renewal units when you registered, we will email those to you after the webinar. It generally takes a couple of weeks and please note that you do have to be pre-registered in order to receive the OPI credit. Unfortunately, we're not currently able to issue other kinds of attendance documentation. Today's session is being recorded for the Montana Deaf Blind Project and Transition and Employment Projects Resource Libraries. And by participating in the webinar, you grant permission for any chats and or questions that you submit through the webinar platform to be recorded. So please make sure that you're not putting confidential information into your questions or the chat box. The video for today's webinar will be posted to the training archives pages, and I will put the URLs or the website addresses for both of those pages into the chat box in just a few minutes as soon as the recordings are available. The handout for today's session is available for download in the handouts area of your screen, and again, that's in your, your dashboard. Um, it's also available on both the Montana Deaf Blind Project and the Transition and Employment Project's training pages. And again, I will put those website addresses in the chat box in just a moment. We do have a short survey that will pop up after you exit the session. We ask that you please take the time to answer the few questions we have on there. They help us to know what worked and what didn't work for you today, and they also help us to plan for future sessions. Laura, can you please go ahead and advance to the next slide? I just want to acknowledge our- Is that it? No, nope. oh, there it is, yes, thank you. And the next one as well. Just making sure that we acknowledge our sponsors and those who have provided funding for this webinar. Thank you. And if you could advance one more time, please. And I would like to turn over the moderation to Teresa Baldry for a quick description of the Montana Deaf Blind Project. Teresa. Welcome and thanks for taking time to join us over the lunch hour here in Montana. We are the Montana Deaf Blind Project um, and I am a project coordinator there. The slide 
has a screenshot of items from our website. So I'll be referring to some of that, but the Montana Deaf Blind Project is a source of specialized information, technical assistance, and resources focused on improving education, including as well as college and career readiness for individuals with a combined hearing and vision loss who are between the ages of birth and 21 years of age. We're located at the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities at the University of Montana. Currently, we have three staff who all work part-time. On the slide, you'll notice toward the bottom, multiple ways to connect with us. So you can contact us via email, phone, fax, or there's even a contact form on our website. We also have a Facebook group, easy to find, Montana DeafBlind Project. And you can learn more about the project and our focus areas of focus on the website. The last piece I wanna cover there is what is DeafBlind? The term DeafBlind can be misleading. It often is viewed in, as a complete absence of vision or hearing. In reality, only about 6% of children who are DeafBlind are without any sight or hearing. Almost individuals have some usable vision and hearing. No two children who are deafblind are alike. The loss of vision and hearing, even minor losses, can greatly impact development and learning. Children who are deafblind must be taught using strategies that are responsive to their individual sensory, cognitive, and physical skills. And why we offer training such as today. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, Laura Buckner who has 30 years experience in the disability field. She is a licensed professional counselor and a former special educator. Laura has invested the last 20 plus years providing training on the local, state, and national levels. Employed by the Texas Center for Disabilities at the University of Texas in Austin, Laura provides trainings nationally on person-centered practices, trauma-informed care, and healthcare transitions among other disability related topics. You could even advance the slide one, Laura. <laughs> Laura is a certified mentor trainer in person-centered practices through the learning community for person-centered practices. She is a <laughs> certified ambassador in the Charting the Life course work created at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Institute for Human Development. While professional experience helps, Laura believes her greatest expertise comes from her lived experience as a mom. Her 31-year-old son, a charming young man with intellectual and developmental disabilities, is both impetuous and inspiration to Laura's work to create inclusive, inclusive communities and the plans that enable people to live lives of choice successfully with the right supports in those communities. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being with us today. I'm honored to um, have this opportunity. This is something that's near and dear to my heart because I am a mom and I have been through the healthcare transition. You know, I'd like to get a quick sense of who is here. And so I'm gonna put up a poll that if I can figure out how to get there now, there we go and just find out um, why you're here, what you're interested in. So you'll just have a come up on your screen and click, you can click one or more of the following and then submit it. And then we'll be able to see what our response is. I'll give it about 30 seconds. It's not hard. Oh, five more seconds. Are we there? I think we're there. So here's our results. I'm thrilled to see that we've got some family members here and some self-advocates. That's fabulous. This is um, personal. But we also have some professionals in, in the... Uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. Now I gotta figure out how to hide it. Okay, there we go. So we're talking about healthcare transition. And usually when I use that term, people give me a dear, I don't know what that is. So we're talking about 
the transition that happens when somebody moves from the pediatric health care world to the adult based health care world. That's what I mean by healthcare transition. So let me do another quick poll and find out what you know. What do you know about healthcare transition? Pick one. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and here are our results. Well, I'm glad to see somebody was successful in their transition. That's good. Folks think that they're well prepared. That's excellent. But look at that overwhelming 53%. Know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to manage the transition. And nearly a fourth are clueless. And that is not uncommon because, let me hide these. This is a study that was done in 2012, not long ago, of pediatric hospitalists. So medical care, medical professionals working in a pediatric hospital ask the same question. The biggest piece of the pie, the red-orange piece, 60% said they know something about healthcare transition. The next biggest piece of the pie, the dark blue, says, I know a great deal. So only one, less than one-third of pediatric hospitalists say they know a great deal. 10%, the turquoise said they know very little, and the black 1% said, I never heard of this. They don't know much, and families and self-advocates know even less. So that's why we're here today. Glad you're here. Here's my objectives for the day. I want to raise your level of awareness, maybe higher than it already is. I want to call attention to some specific hurdles you might not have thought about as you transition. I want to provide an overview of two different sets of tools. You know, it's the darndest thing. Both of these sets of tools are amazing, but they both require about two days of training. And Montana, the Rural Institute, didn't give me two days. So I'm going to give you brief overviews, and I'm going to point you to available resources where you can get more information. And I hope we're all going to move forward on your next steps. So I'm going to start by asking you, what is your definition of a good life, you know, what do you think should happen, be present in your life or your loved one's life? I think you would agree most of these things would be in your in your vision. You want to have friends, you want to have a way to get around, a place to live, hobbies, something to do you find meaningful, a good education, money in the bank, you want your health to be good, you want to have good relationships with people, you want to have things to do that you enjoy. You like the choice. And when I talk, and I have worked with adults with disabilities as well as children all over the country, and when I talk with a lot of, especially adults, they say some of the hardest things to come by because of their disability or chronic health condition are relationships and choice. They want to have a life. And specifically related for today's topic is good health. Right? So I want you to think about your own trajectory. How did you get to who you are, where you are today, doing what you do? Um, because the things that your, your feet were set on a path the minute you were born, and if you're a parent, so were your children's feet. I want to, just to give you an example, let me tell you a quick background of my trajectory. So I was born in West Virginia. You don't have to hate. Um, I Grew up in Columbus, Ohio, so I'm native West. I'm, I'm native West Virginia, but feel like I'm more native Midwest. Um, I'm the oldest of four children. My mother had four children under the age of five. Can you imagine? And so we were all doing chores very early. As soon as we could walk, we were learning to do chores. I was my father was military, so I was raised in a military background with a military code of ethics and work ethic. Uh, my sisters and I still laugh about how we clean up hotel rooms cleaner than we left them, just like we did the campsite. My father was an engineer. I have two siblings who were engineers, and I like to say I got the height gene. I'm the tallest of the family, but I got none of that math and science stuff. 
And so I avoided math and science in school as much as I could. But I loved languages. I was really good at languages. I studied several languages, not that I can speak them, but I studied them. Who knew that that would lead me to an adult life in which my career is public speaking and even writing a chapter for a textbook? Um, I moved to, from Ohio to Texas the middle of my senior year of high school. Let's all just have a moment of silence for me. That was really hard. But it changed my trajectory, did it not? And then my son, David was born and diagnosed at the age of three months, changed my trajectory dramatically um, in many positive ways as well as hard ways. So think about your own trajectory, how you got to who you are, where you are today, and then let's think about your kid's trajectory if you're a family member or if you're a service provider, what are the families you're working with? Think about their loved one's trajectory. Because we know that today's experiences and exposures, even the little tiny ones, influence tomorrow's health. This is a tool I want to share with you, and it's available for free download on the website at the bottom of the slide. I'll show it to you again at the end of the presentation. You have a, um, a copy in your handout, I believe. Um, this comes from a, a group, the USAID, just like the Rural Institute is a USAID. It's a USAID at the University of Missouri. And um, they call it life course tools. This is just one of many tools, but they call this the trajectory. And in a typical trajectory, the solid black line, uh, depending, you know, at any point along the solid black line, from the minute you're born uh, to the to up to 65 and beyond, things that you're exposed to, experiences you have, impact that positive trajectory that takes you where you want to go to what you want to have in, in your life, that quality of life we talked about. Um, that dotted takes you where you don't want to go. And what we know is that often when a child is diagnosed with a chronic health condition and or disability, their trajectory is negatively impacted. And it happens with the best of intentions. Nobody intends to take them to places they didn't want to go and have things they didn't want to have. It's just that the nature of the service system, the human service system, and our systems in general, even some of the things we do as parents, end up taking our loved one in places we didn't want to go to things they didn't want to have. And so let me talk about that a little bit more because I want you to carefully consider it. Think about a, your child. If you're a parent of a child with chronic health condition or and or disability, you had visions for them when they were born. And often when the diagnosis happens, my son's was at three months, we're given this very grim prognosis. My son was diagnosed with a rare disease we'd never heard of before, a very grim prognosis. I'm happy to say at 31, he's not, all of those predictions have not come to fruition, but some of them have. But I lost my vision for him for a few years because I was so, reeling with the reality of what we were dealing with. And that's how that negative, what I call a negative trajectory, the one that takes you places you didn't want to go to things you don't want, that's how that starts often. If you ask a family, if you had asked me years ago, what do you envision for David's life? I probably would have stumbled around and, and not had a clear answer for you because the future for many of us can be really frightening and overwhelming. If that's the case, then I encourage families or service corp professionals to say instead, what is it you're afraid of? What do you worry about? What is your vision for what you don't want for your loved one? Because if we know what we don't want, it leads us and sends us in the direction of what we do want. So sometimes it's easier, not that it's comfortable, but sometimes it's easier by asking, what is it that we don't want? What are we afraid of? What do we want to avoid? This is my son, David, and his vision, his trajectory for a good life. Some of it involves his health. Um, and so you'll notice that's a picture of him wearing his Habitat for Humanity staff shirt. He, he works for Habitat for Humanity part-time, three days a week, but he wears that shirt full-time, seven days a week, because it's important to him. And we'll talk about that some more later. He wanted to go to Disney World. He put in his vision. He wanted to go to Disney World, and we went two years ago. 
he'd like to go again when COVID is over. Um, but there's some things in his positive, that purple cloud at the top are the things he wants in his life, the things he wants to work towards. Some of them are in place. Some of them we're still taking baby steps towards. Some of them we're still trying to figure out. That green cloud below are the things he does not want. He does not want to be in poor health. He does have kidney disease as a part of his chronic health condition. He does not want to have problems with his kidneys. He has had several family members die of heart disease and he knows that can be genetic or passed down in families. He doesn't want heart disease. So you can see how he's uh, painted a trajectory of what he wants to shoot for and what he wants to avoid. And that dotted red line with the solid line, dotted red line going down to the negative, what I don't want, with the solid red line pointing up to what it is I do want, is to point out to you that the longer you are on that negative downward facing trajectory, the harder it is to get to what it is you do want. So start with what you don't want if you don't know what it is you do, and then start spelling it out. This, again, this trajectory um, worksheet is available. Oh, I was going the wrong way. Sorry. This is available um, by free download on the Life Course Tools website. And it starts with just a vision for a good life. What do you, how do you define a good life? You know, those things I started with money in the bank, a good job, a way to spend your days, um, Diet Coke for David, whatever it is. And what is it that you fear or don't want? There's another. Uh, worksheet available for free download on the Life Course website, and it gets specific around healthcare. So, in the top vision for your good life, on the left side of that vision, you have the overall good life, like going to Disney World, drinking Diet Coke, and then your vision for a healthy life is what you want to have happen. David had said he wants to be active and fit, he's a distance runner, he wants to be healthy. He, he does like to drink Diet Coke. He, that's part of his overall good life. And what he doesn't want, again, down in the bottom box, on the left is your overall life. On the, on the right, get specific around your health and your health care management. The Life Force Tools website is here. It's, a, it's a, a connected in several places in your handouts, and I'll show it to you again at the end. But I just wanted you to see what the website looks like when you, so you know you, you're there when you get there. And I encourage you to spend some time there. They have other tools I'm not going to teach today. And they have some really great training videos and people talking about how to do the tools, how they've used the tools, what they're helpful for, et cetera. The other tool that I want to give you a brief overview about, though, today is called person-centered thinking. This also is a two-day training that I often do. And they didn't give me two days. So let's do a quick overview and I'll show you where you can get more information. This comes from a group called the Learning, the Learning Community for Person-Centered Practices. It's an international community, been around for over 30 years. Um, and so the concepts that I wanna share with you this afternoon are being shared all over the US, as well as in Canada, Great Britain, Australia, most recently South Korea. And, um, the other beautiful thing about this work and the concepts that I'm about to share with you are that this has nothing to do with disability or uh, chronic health conditions. It has to do with being a human being. So this next piece will apply to all of us and I'll show you how that, that works. This is about helping people get better lives. You know, my son did 18 plus years in the public school system and if I had all of that paper, we'd have piles and then think about that he's been receiving significant levels of medical care specialist medical care for 31 years think about the paper and yet if I looked for how much of that paper has truly impacted his life in a positive way it's a much smaller much smaller pile here's the core concept this is what I think you need to get Apply to healthcare and it applies to all of us, including our loved ones with disabilities or chronic health conditions. It's the, the core concept is important to, important for, and the balance between those two. Sounds like I'm talking about the very same thing, but I am talking about two things, very different. So let me talk about them. 
Important too, we define as those things in the person's life that helps them feel satisfied, content, fulfilled, comforted, and happy. And it includes everything on this bulleted list. It's the people that you're in relationship with. You know, COVID-19 is impacting our important twos in a major way because even the people that we're in relationship with, we can't hug, we can't be close to, maybe we can't spend time with, right? That's important to us. Our culture is important to us, our identity. Having purpose and meaning is important to us. When I showed you David's one-page profile and I mentioned his Habitat for Humanity staff shirt, it's because his job gives him a tremendous amount of purpose and meaning, and that's important to him. It's about the things we like to do and the places that we like to go. COVID, again, has impacted our important twos in that area, has it not? It's even impacted our status and control. How much control do we have right now in some of our pieces of our lives because of COVID? The, the downside is it's affecting us all and it's really been yucky. The one positive I can see of that is that it gives us as service professionals, perhaps, and maybe even family members, a new level of insight into what it's like to lose what's important to us and not have any choice about that. I'll talk about that some more. There's another piece of important too that just talks about the quality of life, how that person defines quality of life. We use that terminology like we all know what it means, but everyone has a different definition. And you know, COVID again is raising our level of awareness of that. Is it okay that I'd be put on a ventilator if I'm really, really sick with COVID? Some people will say yes, and some people will say absolutely not. That's about quality of life. Now, sometimes our loved ones will tell us that something's important to us with their to them with their words, but their behavior will some say something totally different. Um, so if, if say David says to me, it's very important that I pay very close attention to what I drink, uh, but he wants to order a case of Diet Coke every time he turns around. His words are saying it's important to him. What's his behavior doing? Which do you go with? You go with behavior because that's what he's telling us. Words, actions speak louder than words, right? But when you're working with somebody with a chronic health condition and or disability, I would ask you to go one more step when words and behavior are in conflict. Ask yourself, why are they in conflict? Because here's the thing, people who have been getting services from the system, either medical system or other systems for a good while, we've done a really good job of teaching them how to tell us what they think we want to hear. So often patients will sit in a doctor's office and say, yes, it's very important that I lose 10 pounds. Yes, I'm going to be working on that. And then they go home and they don't pay a bit of attention to it. It's because there's not a good connection to that. And we've, we're telling people what they think we want, what we think they want to hear. We miss all of that important two stuff for our loved ones because when there's a disability and or chronic health condition, we get laser focused on what we call important for health and safety, making sure they take the medicine when they're supposed to, they see the doctors when they need to, they see specialists, we promote good healthy diets and exercise. And even import, as just as important as that is issues of safety. We often, and I say this with great kindness because I've done it myself, we often limit our, our loved one's ability to try new things or take a little risk because we worry they could get hurt or fail. And I would encourage, if, you, if that's something you have struggled with, I would encourage you, and I'll ask um, Kim to put this in the chat because I forgot to include it in resources, but Google Robert Persky, P-E-R-S-K-E. -E. Google his article written in the 70s called The Dignity of Risk because it will point exactly what I'm talking about here. We learn from risk, but often we are so laser focused on health and safety, the important for is our loved one that we don't let them take risk. And then there's one more piece of important for that we often miss, and it's what us that love that person see as necessary if we're gonna help our loved one be valued and be viewed as a cont contributing member of his or her community. The problem is, and you have a 
person with a disability or chronic health condition, often we get so laser focused on important four, excuse me, that all of our weight is put on health and safety. You and I are having a little bit better sense of what that's like because all of a sudden, because of COVID, we're having to put a whole lot more weight on health and safety than we have before. And we don't like it. <laughs> we don't like it at all. It's uncomfortable. It's scary. We don't like it. But the flip side of that is that important too, of course, this is a parent's worst nightmare if you have a kid with a disability. But this doesn't work either. Having everything you want, how you want it, when you want it, with no thought to consequences or health and safety, that doesn't work. And you know, not to politicize COVID-19 any more than it already has been, but we've seen some of this. We've seen huge crowds of people on the beach or huge crowds of people at, a, at some event with no mask and no social distancing. And then we hear the fallout of how many people got infected. Those are, that's a situation where people put all of the weight on what was important to them without a careful consideration of important for perhaps. And what we're looking for is this, we need balance. And that balance is gonna shift around every, by the minute, by the hour, by the day. So I'm gonna give you an example. I want you to practice important to, important for. These are my, I have four dogs at my house. That's another story. But these are two of my longest dogs. Coda is on your left, he's a border collie, and Willow is on your right, she's a golden retriever. In Texas, and I think it's moved into Montana now, we have to have heartworm pills once a month because we have a terrible uh, outbreak of, of heartworm in our state where if a mosquito that carries a heartworm disease um, bites my dog, my dog can get heartworm and it will kill them, flat out. But if you give them a heartworm pill once a month, they're protected and they don't get heartworms and they don't die. Um, Willow on the right, it, you know, when you get the box out of the pantry, it, it says it's flavored like a treat and Willow believes it. She'll wolf it down without a question, but Coda, he smells it coming out of the pantry and he knows it's not a treat. So let's do an important two, four sort. And I'm gonna put a poll up here when I can figure out where to find it, hold on. And I'm gonna ask you, heartworm pill, important two or important four? What's your answer? And well done. Yes, it's health and safety, it's important four. So how does it work if I say to Coda, the border collie on the left, I say, Coda, you can have the important two peanut butter after you eat this important four heartworm pill. Is he going to go? No, I'll find it under the couch or behind the couch or on the floor. No, he, in fact, he won't even get close to it. How's it going to work instead if I say, Coda, I take peanut butter. Let's do important two and four just here with me. Important two and four, peanut butter. Important two or important four? It's important two, isn't it? How does it work if I say, Coda, I'm going to put some peanut butter on the pill and that you take this. He'll take it every time. I did it last night. He wolfs it down. We have to address, and I'm going to move my screen now. Hold on. Important two and four are connected. They influence each other. And none of us does anything that's important for us willingly unless there's a piece of important two connected to it. So when I put that heartworm pill in the peanut butter, he will take it every time. If I did it the opposite way, important four would trump important two and he wouldn't eat it. We have to do the same thing with everything. You know, my son has kidney disease. We have to see a nephrologist. They call nephrologists a kidney specialist. We have to see a nephrologist in Houston. We're gonna go see him in about two weeks. Um, he can talk to David all day long about uh, drinking lots of water, low sodium diet, blah, 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 for kidney health. It goes in one ear and out the other. But he understands that's important too, important for connection. And he knows David is a distance runner. And he knows David has an eye watch. 
and he also has an eye watch. So when he walks in our examining room, he'll say, David, you are looking fit. You look good. You've been running, haven't you? And Dave will say, oh, yes, sir. How far have you been running? Let me see your eye watch. Let's see what you've been doing. They sit there for less than a minute and compare eye watches. He'll say, wow, that's a good pace or whatever. And then doctor, the doctor will say, so David, how are you managing your hydration, your drinking, when you? because you got to drink a lot when you're running in this kind of heat. And then they'll start talking about water, then they move to diet. Do you see how it, Dr. Samuels has embedded kidney health in the important two of distance running? That's exactly what he's done. And that's what we have to do. Um, you know, and they influence each other. Um, I am a former distance cyclist. I used to ride 50 and 100 miles. But about two years ago, I was hit by a truck on my bike. Important, my bike was very important to me. But all of a sudden, because I was so seriously injured, injured, all of a sudden what was important for me tremendously influenced that important too. I'm hoping that makes sense to you. And the balance is dynamic, uh, dynamic. Things are always changing. You can't just do this in a once a year plan and call it good. So we have to support the person to be healthy and safe within the framework of what's important to them. I don't, I, I, I'll I eat peanut butter, they're okay, but I really like the chocolate around that peanut butter. We used to call those Buckeyes in Ohio. So you may be approaching this juncture of this train track. The train track on the right is your pediatric health care system and you're approaching this juncture at which you will move to the adult health care system. And the juncture happens for different people at different times. For many of us, it happens at 18 when the pediatrician can no longer see us or the pediatric hospital no longer treats children. There's a transition. For some, it might happen at the age of 21 when a Medicaid program that's paying for their health care doesn't treat, doesn't uh, support children over the age of 21. And all of a sudden, you, don't, you can't see maybe the specialists that you've seen before. You have to find new ones. For everyone, healthcare transition happens now at the age of 26, at least, when you age out of your parents' health insurance. So you, all of a sudden, you don't qualify for your parents' health insurance, and you got to find your own, and it might or might not cover the same doctors, the same specialists, the same hospitals that you've used in the past. You're approaching a series of junctures. Let's talk about how to get ready. This is a friend of mine when she right after she and her daughter her daughter had just reached that juncture and had made her first visit to the adult uh, hospital and this is what my friend told me she said one of the differences between children's and adult hospitals there's no airplane or butterfly elevator everything is the same if it no one is trying to make sick adults happier even though research has proven that is a very potent medicine I think we may need to take the happy with us next time. And she's right. Um, the adult healthcare system is all about efficiency. Doctors are in and out of examining room very, very quickly. And we have to see if we can bring some of the happy with us. So I want to show you um, the last piece of this presentation. We call one page descriptions. This comes from the learning community for person centered practices, which I spoke about earlier. Is being used nationally as well as internationally. We do one-page descriptions or one-page profiles, and we have to be very, we have to think about them. They have to be intentional. They have to be designed and written for specific situations or specific environments or specific audiences. So this particular, and you have in your handouts, this particular one-page description is for medical appointments. But let me show what they look like. Well, let me talk about them and then I'll show you some examples real quick. We always like to put a nice flattering photo on there because most people's files do not have flattering photos. They have that one that somebody took from the back of the desk. So put a flattering photo on there. We like to start with the column on the left, what people like and admire about this patient because the doctor, the educator, the social service uh, professional, whoever it is, opens the, our child's file and there's a ton of information in there, but most of it is about who they're not, what they're not good at, what they're never going to be good at. So we like to put that there. What's important to this person in this environment is um, on the far right, 
specific to the environment. Don't talk about what works for this kid at school because you're going to a doctor's office. And then the green box on the bottom, really important. We don't talk about what's important for. Instead, we talk about how do you best support my son or daughter in this medical appointment. So let me give, show you some examples because I think it'll help make sense. My son's one page profile, and I bolded in white the things that were strictly specific about his health condition, but all of it would be helpful to any medical professional seeing him for the first time. So some great things about David, if you start there, you find out he's a committed distance runner. So oh, that tells you he's, a, he's an athlete. It tells you a little bit about his drive. It tells you a little bit about his commitment and maybe his fitness level. Um, he's a careful driver, tells you that he's driving a car. He's a train expert, gives you something to talk to him about other than, hi, how are you? Um, on the left box are the things that are important to David. And I especially want you to po want to point out um, the white. He wants to have a choice and he wants to be respected. How often we, have we as family members been in the doctor's office where the doctor will talk to us, even though he can see there's an adult, that this young man is 31, he's clearly an adult. They'll talk to us as if he's not in the room and he picks that up. So I'm letting them know he knows when you're not talking to him. And then how to best support him at medical appointments. My son has a disease that causes tumors. In fact, you can see them in the picture. He's, they're on his face, they're all over his body, his head, his brain. And we have had many medical professionals who've never seen this disease, this diagnosis before. And they walk in the door without even saying hello to start examining him because they're curious about that disease. So he says, ask my permission before I look at my facial or head tumors or ask me questions about my disease. Wouldn't that be helpful to know before you're the, if you're the medical professional, before he comes into your office? Explain your, my medical issues in concrete, plain language terms. He doesn't speak on a high level term, you know, he doesn't speak medical ease. Tell me what you're gonna do before you do it. Give me choices about how it's done. He would always rather have a, a needle as opposed to a bad tasting medicine or a gas mask, good to know. Some other examples, this is Liam. Liam's a young man in South Dakota who has a, um, uh, a diagnosis that has also, it's a genetic diagnosis, but it's also caused him to have blindness and deafness. And when his mother created his one page description for medical appointments, they were coming up on two new medical appointments. The first doctor got, the uh, the met the one page profile in his junk file and he never saw it and she said the appointment was just disastrous, but the second doctor did get it. He printed it out. He shared it with everybody in his office and she said it was like a dream come true, coming into that man's office because they knew how to support Liam at a medical appointment. This is Sophie, another friend of mine's daughter. Sophie also has a rare diagnosis. In fact, she went 21 years without a diagnosis. It's so rare. Um, but I, I'd suggest you look really closely at the bottom of the box on what you can do to best support Sophie. She does not use words, but it says get her height and weight from mom. Don't use, don't force Sophie to get on a scale. It is not going to work. It's going to be pretty. Wouldn't you want to know that? Blood pressure and stethoscope might not be tolerable. Be willing to let it go. This is a young lady who gets a ton of medical care, including at home. So these are some really important supports that help Sophie's medical appointments go smoother and easier. Wouldn't we all want to know that before she came into our examining room? Give her ample wait time to respond. She has apraxia, apraxia and developmental delays. You know, people are not, she will respond. She may not respond with words, but she will respond. So give her time. She almost always says no when she's asked a question. So instead of just taking it as a legitimate no, say, do you mean yes? Try to see if she really does mean yes. And she has a document on how Sophie communicates. So great one page profiles, and there's a million and other examples out there. I want to close this last little piece of my presentation with some resources because my gosh, where do we go from here? Um, you know, those of us who have children under the age of 18 with 
um, disabilities have already made, been dreading the transition process already. I know I dreaded it, Dread, transitioning from the special ed world to the adult um, a world. But now you have another transition to worry about and get prepared for. I want to show you some resources because there's a lot out there, but not everybody knew that this transition was coming. This is a valuable place to spend some time. It's a website called Got Transition, and it is specifically about helping youth and young adults move from pediatric to adult health care. That's a whole website. The first, you'll see four boxes there in the middle of the page. The first box on the left, six core elements, is for clinicians. But I think you as family members or service professionals can benefit from it as well. There's two uh, pages to it available for free download because it talks about three different scenarios. The one on the left talks about uh, a youth transitioning to adult health care clinician. And then it goes through a tracking, monitoring, how do you measure their readiness. Um, the second middle box, the turquoise box, talks about transitioning to a, an adult approach for health care, but not changing clinicians. Some, I do know some people who their pediatrician has said, I will just keep seeing you. Um, and so there may be that kind of situation, or we see a clinic in Houston that treats both children and adults, so we've been able to keep going with them beyond 18. And then the box on the right, the purple, is for integrating young adults into the whole world of adult health care. It's two pages. It goes into the transition policy guide, creating one of those. This, again, is for clinicians, but you can learn a lot from it. It's about how to track and monitor these kids. It's about measuring their transition readiness, planning their transition, how to transfer their care, and complete the transition. Those of us who've had children with chronic health conditions and or disabilities, who've had a lot of years under 18 with medical professionals, leaving those people is hard because we've trusted them. We have, they've gained our confidence we know they know our child and they know our child's medical or condition or health condition and leaving all of that leaving that level of comfort is just painful and so well well prepared clinics and well prepared prepared medical professionals can ease that transition families can do the same so i encourage you to look at that but the other thing that i'll show you on that website is that gold box next to six core elements that if you click on that box, that is specific for youth and young adults transitioning to health care. If you look at the right box uh, in blue, that is specific for parents and caregivers. And then the red box on the right is for resources and research. I'll warn you, you can spend a lot of time on this website, but it will be well worth your time if you're preparing for a health care transition. Other resources, and I see Therese is letting me know we have a question, so I'll get to that in just a moment. Let me finish this real quick. There is a doctor in Houston. He's a pediatrician at Texas Children's Hospital, major hospital, who has for 20 years had this major concern that we are not addressing health healthcare transition. And so for 20 years, he has run a conference in Houston and people from all over the country and outside of the country attend it. Right now, it is still on for an in-person conference. They haven't declared it virtual yet. I'm watching and waiting. But if it's something that you think you're interested in, I would encourage you to look at this website um, because registration will open soon. And even if you can't come to Houston, they usually do at least two of the presentations um, simulcast. And I know they use the USEDs to simulcast a lot of those. So check with Montana, see if that's something that they're gonna be part of. Um, the guy that runs this, his name is Dr. Albert Hergenroder. And he he uh, had me speak at his conference about three or four years ago, and he sat right on the front row. I was simulcast all over the country, and, and I watched him taking these furious notes. I thought, oh, gosh, what am I saying? He took me aside later, and he said, I wish you could come to every Grand Rounds. Every medical professional needs to hear what you're teaching. And it was all about important two and four and that connection, addressing important four in the context of important two. About two years later, he wrote a book. Oh, I have to get it, but let me get it. He wrote a book. It's a medical textbook. 
on healthcare transition, and he asked me to write a chapter. Um, I think I have it in this one. Yeah. So I am chapter five of his medical health, medical textbook on healthcare transition. Um, healthcare transition from the family perspective. It's not a cheap book. It's a textbook. But if you're a professional or involved with professionals who might need the, the information, it's out there. It's on Amazon. Some other resources I want to quickly point to you, and then we're going to get to questions. Um, I showed you the Gut Transition website. I showed you the book. The Rural Institute from, of Montana is who's hosting this webinar today. We are so appreciative um, because it's a topic we're not talking about enough in, in this country, in this field. Um, and I will tell you that I have been using the Rural Institute as a parent for probably 25 years. Um, they have some amazing resources and amazing information out there um, that helped me direct my son's tra trajectory. And then the last website I want to point out to you is up in the top left, supportdecisionmaking.org. You know, as your child approaches the age of 18, when they turn 18, they're no longer legally an adult. That means they can't make this, they can't, um, you can't make decisions for them. You can't have access to any of their files or their records. You can't speak for them, et cetera, et cetera. And many parents, as they approach that transition of their child turning 18, they panic. And unfortunately, a lot of times they get information from the school that leads them to believe they have to get guardianship. It's not that the school is a bad, bad place, but they just don't always know all the options. And so families will run out the door to get guardianship of their son or daughter before they turn 18. Getting guardianship requires the help of an attorney. You have to go to court and prove your son or daughter's incompetence and they are declared incompetent in a number of areas by a judge. You have to report to the court annually. It's an expensive, time-consuming process, and the bottom line, it takes away your son or daughter's rights to make their own decisions. So a new form of, a new uh, alternative to guardianship is called supported decision-making. I'm proud and happy to say that Texas was the first state to get a legal document. Um, and what it basically says is, okay, my son, we do not have guardianship of my son. We do have medical power of attorney. We've, we've used all the alternatives we can think of, but we have not gotten guardianship. But we want to get supported decision making. He could choose some people that he trusts, his family, some friends, people that he trusts, people that we trust, that could help him weigh his options when he has to make a decision help him think clearly about his choices and help him make the best decision he can make without making it for him. So I encourage you, if you're in this place, to look at the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making. It's taking hold nationally and it's a legal alternative to guardianship. You know, I'll end here that we're used to seeing the caterpillar that puts itself in a chrysalis and then eventually turns into a butterfly. And sometimes when our kids are young and the, scare, the, the, the future is scary, all we can see is that caterpillar that's not going to go anywhere, not going to do anything. But in baby steps, over time, our children come and can become beautiful butterflies. And that's that trajectory. So you want to get real intentional about thinking about that trajectory. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will take questions. Does somebody want to say the question or do I need to pull it up? Hi, Laura, this is Teresa, and I have things pulled up for us to discuss. So I'm going to start with a comment that came in from Barbara, just thanking you that she loves uh, the guys and OH. Um, <laughs> the first question that I want to take you to goes back to your one pager. Okay. And on the one pager introduction, would you include if you have guardianship or supported decision making? Um, I probably would. Um, you know, let me, I, I hadn't thought about that, but I probably would. I probably would. If you, um, if you have an adult child, you know, uh, it's surprising to me how often we have to take, hold on. 
we have to take our adult son in for like to the emergency room. We've learned to just stay really quiet and have them talk to him first because if we talk first, they often think his injury is a cause is a result of abuse. And so we've learned to stay very, very quiet and let him talk and then they figure out there's a developmental disability and then they turn to us. But in more recent years, I've carried paperwork. Um, and so you could put a note and say, uh, under the support, you could say, um, so and so and so and so has legal guardianship of this patient. I would put it at the bottom. I wouldn't make it the first thing. I'd just make it one of those bullets or so and so or or this patient has supported decision making. Please ask him about it. Does that answer the question? I'm not seeing a response that it doesn't. The piece that I would add to that, Laura, and the answer is yes, it did answer the question. I did see it listed in one of the examples that you shared. Okay. So it was something that someone had captured. And within that concept of what else is available, one of the resources at the Rural Institute under our Transition and Employment Projects is a project called Alternatives to Guardianship. There you'll find a toolkit yes. as to what's available in the state of Montana that sometimes is applicable in other states as well. And you'll also find a fact sheet there. So I just wanted to share that as an additional resource for people. Yes. Then I'm going to move to the next comment here, Laura, because it's more of a comment. I um, see it from Ivy. She's a dear friend. friend. <laughs> that, Laura, the Chronic Illness and Disability Conference in Houston will be all virtual. On the planning committee, registration information should be forthcoming, and you can learn more at texaschildrens.org forward slash transition conference. As a piece to add in there, um, we did stream the conference last year, and it awesome. is our intention to provide access to it this year. We'll just have to learn how they're doing it virtually and what that may look like for our supporting that then. Fantastic. Yeah. In regard well, to the first you. one, there was an additional comment that the ARC um, in Texas also has a su supported a supported agreement document. Yes, yes, they do. Um, I'm I'm putting this up, and and the the uh, Rural Institute will certainly have my email address. If I have not answered a question you had, or something comes up for you later. I certainly do not mind you emailing me. I will ask you, hey, I heard you on the Montana webinar, because otherwise I won't have a clue how what you're talking about. Just remind me how we connected. And the last thing I would just close with is that you're headed for a cliff, or you already know that. Don't fall. Preparation is key. And I want to thank you for spending your lunch hour with me, and thank you at the Rural Institute for hosting this. Um, and I'll turn it back to them. Thanks. Thank you very much, Laura. Just a couple closing comments. A reminder that a short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as you close out of the webinar. Do please take time to complete that. We really appreciate the responses. We do have several more webinars scheduled. We have a two-part webinar series on understanding and nurturing the communicative competence of learners with significant disabilities. The first part of that will be on August 10th and the second part on August 12th. Both of those sessions will last from 9.30 until 11.30 Mountain Daylight Time. The registrations are available on the Montana Deaf Blind Project training page and on the Transition and Employment Projects training page. And both of those website addresses are in your question or chat box. And then on September 23rd, we will have a webinar on SSI and SSDI work incentives. And on September 30th, we will have a webinar on SSI age 18 redetermination. So we're, we don't have the flyers available for those two social security related sessions yet, but we will be getting those out shortly. So mark your calendars. A reminding that the recording from today's presentation will be posted to both the Deaf Blind Project website and the Transition and Employment Projects websites. It takes a couple of weeks to do that, but that way, if you found the information today helpful and you want to share it with other people, send them to the websites and they can watch the video and get the information. And finally, I just wanted to thank Laura from the bottom of my heart. We've been talking about this presentation since December, I believe, and I'm just delighted that you were yes. willing to be patient with us. And um, present fabulous information today. Thank you to all of our audience members who took the time to join us. Thank you to Teresa for 
co-facilitating, co-moderating with me. And thank you to our captioning professional whose fingers have just been flying throughout the presentation. I wish you all a great rest of your day. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.